The Magic Flute is kind of like the Midsummer Night's Dream of opera. You could take your mom to see it and she'll be fine. It's kind of a miracle that the best film version would be made by doom and gloom maestro Ingmar Bergman, the Seventh Seal Ingmar Bergman, Virgin Spring Ingmar Bergman, Fanny and Alexander Ingmar Bergman. Bergman had wanted to film The Magic Flute since he was a child. Little Ingmar had a puppet theater, but he couldn't afford film or cameras or a recording of the music, so it took about 40 years for him to get there. I was 12 years old when I saw the magic flute for the first time at the Royal Opera House in Stockholm. The curtain came up for a brief scene and went down again immediately. The orchestra huddled in its pit. After an interminable wait, the curtain went up for the next brief scene. Young Bergman saw the possibilities the theater had to offer somebody who had a little bit of imagination. If you sat on the third balcony on the side, it was cheaper than going to the movies. I became a frequent opera goer. The magic flute became my companion through life. This essay is the second in an accidental series of videos about converting stage plays into cinema and the radically different ways it could be done. The first video on The Lion in Winter discussed using real locations to dramatize the fictionalized lives of real people. I could just as easily have done that on The Trojan Women by Euripides, another brilliant but mostly ignored Katharine Hepburn film. The final video is going to deal with Best Picture winner My Fair Lady, hardly an obscure film, but one that does its own thing, an adaptation of an adaptation of an adaptation of an adaptation of a legend. That will, like Bergman's film, grapple with trying to translate theater to film. Here Bergman is also trying to recreate childhood magic. In my mind, I've always seen the magic flute living inside that old theater, in that keenly acoustical wooden box with its slanted stage floor, its backdrops and wings. I should probably say something about the plot. Prince Tamino gets lost in a foreign land, chased by a dragon and saved by three horny witches who serve the Queen of the Night. He picks up a sidekick, the adorable but unreliable birdcatcher Papageno. The Queen asks Tamino to rescue her kidnapped daughter from the sorcerer Sarastro, and smitten by the Princess Pamina's beauty, Tamino agrees at once. But when he arrives at Sarastro's Temple of the Sun, not everything is as it seems. Pamina is actually the daughter of Sarastro, and Tamino has gotten caught up in what's basically an ugly custody battle. For inexplicable reasons, Sarastro has left his daughter in the care of a lustful servant, and Papageno and Tamino, mostly Papageno, free her from her captivity. But the three are captured by Sarastro very shortly after, who turns out to be a real mensch. Well, he's a sexist mensch, but he's one who takes care of his people and seeks justice. Tamino decides to join Sarastro's side and must undergo three trials alongside Papageno. Papageno fails miserably, but Tamino braves darkness, silence, and the fires of hell to join the Brotherhood and win Pamina as his bride. The angry servant sneaks the Queen of the Night and her army into the palace, but they're defeated in like maybe two seconds by somebody who opens a window. Which is fine, because we didn't really care that much about that storyline anyways. What it did was set up Tamino as somebody who was duped by the world and, and has overcome his bad knowledge with study and discipline. I recently caught a production of Julius Caesar by the Independent Shakespeare Company in Los Angeles. They filled out the play's cast of thousands on their modest budget by making us, the crowd, into Rome's crowd. We were shouting for the glory of Caesar and the deaths of his murderers in a way that was very uncomfortable and extremely real, like shouting crucify him on Maundy Thursday. In a way, it threw you out of the moment, but in another way it forced you into the reality of the story. Yeah, I'd never do that, we say, of the fickle Papagano's failures, but we would, and we do. The Overture spends a fair amount of time showing you the diversity of the audience. The little girl who we follow throughout seems enraptured from the very first notes, and Bergman asks us to follow her and his passion for the story. Other audience members are interested at different levels. Since this review is about Bergman's film and not about Mozart's opera, I'm going to avoid going into a whole lot of detail here. Nothing on the whole Freemason thing or Mozart's portrayal of real-life people as a queen in Sarastro, but I do think it's worth mentioning that while Papageno gets the catchiest songs, the Queen of the Night was written expressly for Mozart's sister-in-law, and remains one of the most challenging roles in opera thanks to the extreme range and tight control required. Bridget Norden pulls it off in Bergman's film, I doff my hat to any singer who can do any of this stuff. Hock and Hagegard as Papageno is honestly the best part of the show. Maybe not the most vocally athletic, but clearly the most lovable. He's got a strong Sean Astin vibe going that makes the whole show just fun to watch. 
This is an intensely nostalgic film, which blends the views of audience members with their fantasies of what might be happening. Intermission has the dragon trotting around in the break room and fairy lads reading Donald Duck comics, as if they were really those characters but just in the modern world. The great conductor Herbert von Karajan criticized Bergman for making changes to the opera, saying that Mozart needs to be left organic and alone. But organic was not what Bergman was after here. He went for a Swedish libretto aimed at dragging in a layman's audience. He couldn't film in the Stockholm Theater where he himself was baptized into this opera, so he did up a soundstage in Germany to mimic it as closely as possible. Some scenes force the viewer to think about the paper moon hanging over a cardboard sea, but others remind you that it wouldn't be make-believe if you'd just believe in me. Shots appear that would be impossible in the theater, Princess Pamina running down a snowy alleyway, or Prince Tamino adoring a magic locket in which his bride-to-be appears in Harry Potter-like action. This is the joy of live theater. We are at once assaulted with the clear reality of what's happening. If somebody slips, they or we could get a sword to the belly. The actors react to each other in real time, and an army of behind-the-scenes people are rushing to accomplish instantly what several teams of international CGI artists would need months to do. On the other hand, there's only so much the stage can do without our help as audience members. The magic locket, the hellish trials endured by Tamino and Pamina at the end, these are impossibilities that our surrogate, a young girl in the audience fills in for us. Nothing is. Everything represents. The moment the curtain is raised, an agreement between stage and audience manifests itself, and now together we create.